Hello, my name is Ian Scales. You're watching Telecom TV. And today I'm here at the Internet of Healthcare event in London, where I'm going to be talking to John Altrup, who is the Medical Director, CRIL, Cambridge Respiratory Innovations Limited, that stands for. John, thanks very much for appearing here. It's my pleasure. What, could, you, could I ask you just to introduce your role and, and your company first? Certainly. So I have got a, a couple of hats. I wear the hat of a, an NHS uh, emergency clinician, half-time. And my other hat, which is the reason I'm here, is as the co-founder and medical director of a small Cambridge-based uh, startup company. And uh, we've recognised that there is uh, a need uh, for, for a new medical device, um, particularly in the area of respiratory medicine. And our company has set out to develop that device and to um, design the systems into which it needs to be deployed. Okay, and is that still under the radar or can you talk a little bit more about it? Um, in broad terms we can talk about it, yeah. So what does it do and why is it different from the other devices that so preceded it? That's a good question. Um, people who have respiratory problems um, don't at the moment have devices that can um, easily measure and quantify their, their lung function. So there are some subjective measurements, um, but they're very, very crude. And so there isn't a metric which describes how well or how badly your lungs are. Mm. And that's what our device does. And in doing so, it provides the missing link to a, a feedback system that allows mm. clinicians to act on that data um, based on evidence. Right. And that hasn't happened in respiratory medicine at all. Oh, okay. So unlike heart medicine, for instance, where you know, keeping records of, of heart function and so on has been quite long-standing, so respiratory has not, really not done that yet at all. So that's a good comparison. I think the cardiologists have adopted technology quite quickly, and partly that's because s some of the things they measure are much easier to measure. So everybody recognises the ECG, um, it, it's something that is cheap and reproducible and you can extract numbers from it. And, and, and those are the requirements of any metric. Um, and so the, the, the cardiologists have, have got a good head start, I'd say, uh, and, and their mentality is very much one of you know, preventative. Yes. Um, you know, monitor how well you are, work out your risk factors and, and, and guide your treatment and their interventions. And that's, that's, we're following that model with a tool that ticks all those boxes. Okay, and the cardiologists had the good fortune to have a heart which beat it. <laughs> or, or beat, and, you, and w what is the equivalent with lungs then? That, I presume that's the difficulty that you, it's a whole range of measures that you've got to be able to sort of bring together. So I think that's a really good question. You're, you're right, the, the physiology of the heart means that we can measure its electrical activity and technology has existed for a long time to do that. It's, it's not a difficult thing to do. We would like to claim that by analogy we've got now a way of measuring on a on a breath-by-breath -breath basis what your lungs are doing and in our case we're monitoring the carbon dioxide that your lungs produce and that measurement of carbon dioxide has been known about for a long time it's called capnometry um, and the technology to do it has been out there for a long time but it's very old technology so although they can measure something they can't measure it very well and that means that the, the capnometry technique has stayed in the hands of the anaesthetists who use it uh, predominantly in the operating theatres um, because it's big equipment, it's power hungry, it's expensive and its performance meets their requirements but their requirements are not very demanding. And we have solved the technical problems that allow us to make those measurements much more accurately and we've put it into a device which basically makes that a, a portable device. We mm. can take their technique out of the operating theatre and we can put it into handheld devices and, uh, and that opens up a whole new range of applications. Very interesting. Have we've, you launched it or are you still heading so towards it? We have a CE marked product. We're not at the moment 
selling it in volumes, but we, we are using that to collect clinical data to validate that this technique um, uh, works, works, basically, yeah. Um, are you heading towards greater integration, as we say, in the IT business to make it cheaper to use this handheld device? So, so, so what's been a very important learning f up till now is that making a device that measures something is part of the story. But embedding it into a system which meets other needs, which are the patient's needs, it is equally important. And so that integration, it, it, the system itself will include our device, but as part of a, as part of a feedback system, which, which needs all that connectivity that you refer to. Yes, yes. And is um, carbon dioxide the only measure that you use? So our device at the moment is optimized to measure carbon dioxide. It could be retuned to measure some other things. Um, other technologies measure other things too, but CO2 is, is the primary thing that your lungs are basically producing. Mm -hmm. So it's a direct measure of what your lungs are up to, basically. It is, a bit like a heartbeat. So mm. you, you take in air, you keep the oxygen and you spit the, the carbon dioxide out, so you measure the, the carbon dioxide. Is that layman's definition of it? Pr pr well, y yeah, you, you, you need the oxygen for a whole range of metabolic processes. Mm -hmm. And the waste product of those processes is the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide, and that's what you need to get rid of. Yes. Okay. And the amount that you get rid of uh, depends on the health or or, or the, the 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 conditions that your lungs have. And so there's a signature to be found. If you have a particular disease, the amount of CO2 and how you breathe it out is is a signature for for that disease. For, for yes, quite I understand. So. Are you looking to the, um, to the medium future where this becomes a device that people would actually purchase or have assigned to them, that they would keep it home and then use it to report back? Or is it going to be you know, controlled by the medical system and applied where necessary? So, so yes, you, your, your question is about how do we get it out and, and uh, into the market. Yes. And I think that very much depends on which market we go to. And one model which the NHS has adopted is that with diabetic machines they give away the, the machine and they have a consumable and in our case we have data as well. So within the NHS um, that could be one way that it's deployed but because of the changing landscape of the NHS there may be another model which says that CCGs may buy it because it's more cost effective to manage their patients with it. Yeah, I see. Outside of the UK, there are other healthcare systems and insurance-based models, and there may be just outright sale there. So we still have quite a bit of work to do to work out how best to, to get the technology into the hands of the patients and, the, and who's going to pay for it, basically. Yes. yes. But in one way or another, it would be economically feasible in an advanced economy for people to own these if they had some sort of chronic lung condition. Yeah, we very much see it as a device which we hope people see as a, as a tool to help them own their disease. So, and that's an important um, point that we're trying to make. This device is moving ownership of the disease away from the secondary clinicians and the primary clinicians and it's giving patients information that makes them uh, um, a more important part in the disease management mm -hmm. process. So it's, sh it's going to change the pathways by which these diseases are managed. And that ownership concept has come up time and again when I've been doing these interviews and it's mm. almost a, a thread linking them all together, mm. uh, which is very important. And that kind of buys people in, to use another metaphor, into the whole process, whereas before it was something the doctor did to you. Uh, you're absolutely right, and, and we're, changing that, uh, yeah. we're changing that model completely. Okay, and are your early devices are going to be recording the data and keeping it, or are you going to spit it out back to the uh, to, to central office in real time? Right, so for the purposes of the trial that we've done, the requirement was that they store the devices locally, but ultimately the devices will collect the data locally, do some real-time processing to give information to the, to the patient, but they will additionally spit the data into a database which we do more complex mathematical mm -hmm. analysis on and yeah. which 
allows the clinicians to um, make informed decisions about how they're managing the patients. Yes. Yeah. And then that database has great value as well to a whole bunch of people yes. because it's, um, it, it, it could be the respiratory health of the nation, for example. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, drug companies could use it. Could, you know, the people that are testing the drugs use yeah. it. Yeah. So you, can see. you could, for example, you could see how well your hospital or your set of clinics are managing patients with respiratory problems. You could see on a regional basis. You could see a national basis. You could see hotspots. Of, so it's epidemiological data. Yes, yeah. But you're right. The drugs companies would probably bite your hand off to yes. know. Well, you could optimise how their medications are are deployed, but you do, could also, obviously, they'd want to compare. Yes. And it gives them a tool as well to, to quantify how, in, in the development pipelines, how, how their drugs are doing, which at the moment they can only do by very indirect measures. Yes, yes. So uh, I imagine that there will be interest from the med tech companies, there'll be interest from the pharma companies, and there'll be interest from the big data companies. So the Googles, the uh, IBM Watson, um, the, the people who are looking at, uh, at your big data, big yeah. health data, basically. Yes, yes, yes. And do you have an idea in your mind how, how the, the model, the business model would work? You would have a, a kind of cloud repository, like a, like a Watson repository for all the data, which would then be manipulated by the people that you grant access to the database to? So we're, we're sort of having those conversations at the moment, and that's one possible approach. But on the way to getting there, we're finding that in different healthcare systems, um, there are some ethical issues about ownership of the Your data, and, stuff, yeah. and whether or not hospitals want to release that data and who owns the data in an anonymized version, for example. So th that model is still being defined. We, we need the data in order to um, optimize the analysis of it and our, and our IP is around that. Yes. We don't necessarily need to know the patient's personal details and if we can uh, set that model up so both the hospital, the patients and the device developers are in agreement and yes. get what they want out of it. And yes. I think that's the thing about this whole project is that who are the stakeholders, what do they want and how do we set these structures in place so that everybody gets what yes. they want yes. rather than historically an engineer's designed a device and, and given it uh, to a patient who then tells them well it only does half the yes. job that yes. it needs yes. to do. Right. So It's a win-win-win in other words. We hope so, that's the plan. John, thank you very much. Great, That's lovely great. to talk to you. Same thank you very much. Thank you. Great.